I'm Mark Bernier, the moderator and the interviewer for tonight's event. The CIA does work all around the room and around the country. You, you could have a CIA person right here. They're the greatest intelligence gathering mechanism that the United States government has. And the reason that the United States government makes many of its decisions is because of what this intelligence group does. In the 1990s, our guest was the director of the CIA. He also holds the rare title of ambassador. Tonight, the policies that shape this country's future as it deals with Russia, China, Iraq, Iran, and possibly North Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to introduce, and we ask for a warm, embry riddle welcome for the former director of the CIA, the Honorable Ambassador James Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Right over here. Thank you for coming to Embry-Riddle. It's good to see you, sir. My pleasure. You know, it's interesting because of your, we talked on radio when President Trump was running for office. We spoke by phone. And they said, do you know what that guy was once? He's a Democrat. <laughs> Appointed by President Clinton, correct? Well, I served four presidents, two Republicans, two Democrats. Uh, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, uh, George H.W. Bush, and uh, Bill Clinton. Okay. And I guess my first question is, how does politics interweave with foreign policy? In other words, administrators, when they appoint somebody to the CIA, if their nature is to be more of conservative principles or progressive principles, does that enter into it with a progressive or conservative president? I think it's fair to say that for most appointments, in the national security area, the assistant and undersecretaries of defense, the undersecretaries, assistant secretaries of state, uh, the National Security Council staff, uh, people don't pay much attention uh, to party. They care whether or not you're very liberal or very conservative, if they're, if they're the opposite and you may not get picked or get picked to do something uh, on that basis. But party is not, uh, uh, Salient. I mean, I, I, I'm a bit off the beaten track having served Republicans and Democrats as much as I have, but to some extent that's not uh, all that unusual. Uh, it used to be even more uh, a matter of the politics stops at the water's edge. Um, we're all in this uh, together for national security and don't worry about what party anybody is. Um, I was the general counsel of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, when I was still in my 20s, uh, 29, and I just taken over the job, I'm chief lawyer for this important congressional committee, and my boss uh, was the chairman of the committee, of course, Senator John Stennis of Mississippi. And uh, uh, a friend of mine who worked for Senator Ted Kennedy had told me of something that Kennedy was, was going to say that was going to be critical of our committee and I said, could I give Stennis a heads up? And he said, oh yeah, go ahead, it won't, won't, won't hurt, It'd give him a little advance uh, notice. So I did, and as I was explaining to Stennis what Kennedy was about to do, Stennis reaches over and sort of pats me on the arm and says, Jim, I, 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 you've only been working here now for a, a few months and we need to, to get a little clearer on, on one thing. Uh, as long as you're here, I always want you to let me know anything you can honorably let me know, but I, I don't know about this. S the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, a very conservative Democrat from Mississippi, was worried that I might be violating a confidence with Ted Kennedy's staff member in keeping him informed. Wow. That would not be a common occurrence in today's Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Because you were a lifelong Democrat, and we shared this, that we're both fans of the late Scoop Jackson, a senator, are you, are you a Scoop Jackson Democrat? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah, still am. I just, you know, I, and Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman, Joe Lieberman, 
Uh, I, I like those guys, and that's, uh, uh, you know, they tend to be of the view that politics stops at the water's edge, and they don't take politics into consideration much uh, when they're dealing with, uh, if at all, when they're dealing with foreign policy and national security questions, although both are kind of true to their historic backgrounds and substantive views on a number of social and, uh, and uh, economic issues. This is background. We're going to get into some of the countries in just a moment, but help me with this. In doing my research for tonight, you were appointed by President Clinton, mm -hmm. but you never got to really talk to President Clinton. You well, said, I'd have to crash a plane into the no. lawn of the White House to see this guy. What happened really was that that little airplane back, in the, this was in 94, I think, crashed into the south lawn of the White House, right next to the White House. And the White House staff joke at the time was that must have been Woolsey still trying to get an appointment with Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason that was the joke was that it, Clinton was a speed reader, and he didn't like sitting and having people read stuff at him. So he would take the briefing and skim it and annotate it. He'd write questions. Jim, this is like so similar to so-and-so's most recent book. Have you read it yet? Bill. You know? and, and so I had stuff that he would look at. And after in a number of circumstances, of course, we'd have National Security Council meetings, and I went to all or virtually all of those. Uh, so I would be at the same table with the president and have a chance afterward to, for one minute to grab him and say, Mr. President, I need to let you know, ba da da. But what I did not have was a reporting relationship whereby systematically once a week or twice a month or whatever, I went in and saw him one on one or two on two. We only had two. Um, Two on two, me and my deputy, him and the vice president. We only had two and two, uh, 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 two meetings that were two plus two uh, in um, in the two years I was in the job. The thing that was interesting to me in reading this was the president picks the head of the CIA. Hmm. So I'm thinking he knows him from business. He knows him based on recommendations from people. You didn't really know? Him? No, I didn't. Wow. Uh, what happened was uh, my friend. Uh, Dave McCurdy, who was a congressman from Oklahoma and had been the uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, decided to turn down the CIA job offer and uh, uh, go into business instead. And uh, Dave suggested <clears throat> me, fellow Oki, and uh, so uh, they were running out of time, I think, and they wanted to have a press conference, and so they kind of threw me into the, uh, the breach. Uh, but uh, uh, I was new enough that uh, sitting around the living room of the governor, Arkansas, uh, this is in December of, uh, of 93, uh, 92, uh, sitting around the, the living room, uh, people were being introduced to the press, and uh, on the side, uh, D.D., uh, um, What's her last name? Oh, Dee Dee Myers. Dee Dee Myers uh, had said something to me about, Admiral, did you consider such and such? And I said, Dee Dee, I, I'm not an admiral. I, I never got above army captain. <laughs> and she said, whoops, we better change the press release. Oh. <laughs> I, so I came that close to being announced as Admiral uh, Woolsey. It's a noble title. It just was a little difficult to run do it. <laughs> So there are some people who, and I learned it later after we initially were talking, ambassador to the negotiation on conventional armed forces in Europe, Vienna, 1989-1991. How do you fit that on a business card? I don't. I don't have business cards. It's, <laughs> but um, I was the ambassador and chief negotiator for that. What was at one time a very important treaty because it limited all of the Russian conventional weapons, tanks, artillery, manpower, et cetera, and the parts of the Soviet Union where they could be based. Uh, uh, we never would have gotten that kind of an agreement if it uh, hadn't have been for the fact that in December of 1989, the Berlin Wall collapsed. And uh, let me tell you, if you want to get along nicely with Russians, see if you can do something to destroy one of their empires. They're sweethearts after that. <laughs> They're really very friendly. Uh, uh, I, uh, I found right after the Berlin Wall went down, when I was running these negotiations, 
uh, my Russian counterpart and, and other Eastern Bloc folks, would, they'd send people over to talk to me to see if their son could get into such and such a school in the United States. I, all, I mean, I, they'd all want to go out drinking. I'd take them to a night at the opera I'd, in Vienna. I'd uh, have a barbecue at my house, a joint Soviet-American barbecue. I did everything I could because they were in a very weak position for the negotiations and everything else. And um, they basically kind of needed a friend. Now, I don't know that that's ever again going to be the, right, the way that we need to look at our Russian counterparts because uh, they aren't uh, going that way now with Mr. Putin, to put it mildly. Um, but in that window of time, from 89 to about 93 or 94, um, getting along with the Russians was actually a matter of graciousness uh, not a matter of pounding the table. I did have to pound the table once. Uh, the treaty had been completed and uh, a summit held uh, the world leaders to sign it in Paris. And uh, everything seemed fine. And then the Russian military put out a statement saying they were not going to abide by the treaty. And the White House sent me and a, a Foreign Service officer and a brigadier general over to see the Russian military and see if we couldn't persuade them to uh, do something reasonable that way. They uh, continued to resist, and I asked to see the Minister of Defense, Yazov. They showed me into his office area in the Kremlin, and I thought it would probably just be a cup of coffee in five minutes in his outer office. No, they showed me into a big conference room that had a ceiling about as high as the one here, and in, in from here to the top. It had a giant painting of Alexander Nevsky defeating the Teutonic Knights behind uh, the, the Minister of Defense, and about 15 or 20 admirals and generals were behind him, and I had my, my one little brigadier general. And uh, we listened to them for a long time, for about an hour, as Yazov, the defense minister, talked about how, how peace-loving the Russian military was, how good they da 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 And finally, uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, we are going, in Russian translated, we are going, after this set of negotiations is over, we are going to have naval arms control, and we'll limit your aircraft carriers. The, pushed his hand across the table and nearly got to me. We'll, have, we'll limit your aircraft carriers and your submarines. And I had been very statesmanlike for an hour plus and talked about like this and this kind of a voice. And when he said he was going to limit our submarines, I said, over my dead body, just like that. And, <clears throat> and he startled. And all of the, these generals and admirals behind him, and then they all broke into a big grins. And he closed down the negotiations, and they all came around the table, and each one shook my hand, patted me on the back, basically saying, way to go, young man. You finally figured out how to talk to us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into the different countries, I know the answer to the other question. What's your best day? as the director of the CIA. Was there a day that when you went home, you said, I did good work today, I accomplished something, I'm glad I was here? I think it's probably the day uh, that the Predator uh, became uh, a clear and determined program with a flight test regime behind it. Uh, it wasn't so much a single day as a brief period of time. but. We were opposed by practically every, uh, for a time, every uh, one of the four air forces in the U.S. military, because each of our four services has its own air force. And uh, uh, we fought through and, and got the unmanned aerial vehicle, the drone, uh, uh, approved for uh, going operational. And um, that, I think, has changed a lot in, um, I was, uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a dinner not long thereafter, and I was toasted by someone as the father of the predator. 
And I stood up and said, stop, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not the father of the predator. Abe Karam, who is the Israeli-American designer uh, uh, of it, I said, Abe Karam was the father of the predator. Jane, who's sitting in the back row, and I can't use her real name, who did the software and the engineering and the testing, and so Jane was the mother of the predator. I was the shadchan. And everybody in the audience who knew any Yiddish laughed. The ones who did not couldn't quite remember, probably, Fiddler on the Roof, that the matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. It's the matchmaker is the shadchan, who goes back and forth between the boy's family and the girl's family and figures out who should marry whom. That's kind of what I did to bring the predator uh, around. I was the matchmaker. And uh, uh, it, it's changed a lot, and I, I think we're still ahead in the technology of it, and I think it's changed things from our point of view for the better, although it's possible to misuse drones just as it's possible to misuse lots of things. As a side note, this may be the first time that anyone's brought Fiddler on the Roof into the embry Riddle Speaker Series. <laughs> and hey, sung it. Yeah, yeah. You know what? This is the largest audience for an intelligence discussion since Valerie Plain was here two years ago. How many of you were in the audience for Valerie Plain? Wow. Did you get a shot? of this audience from, you gotta do this. You gotta do, it. like right here. I don't care, program's on, get the shot. Because when Valerie Flame was here, people were like, locked you up. I gotta, so I gotta ask you, what did you think of her and her story? Did you know, did you know the ambassador or husband? No, I didn't know either of them. I, I think the legal uh, issue uh, is one that uh, the length of time uh, she had been back doesn't really qualify for the statutory steps that were, were taken. Um, I, uh, uh, as you imagine, uh, would uh, disagree with her on just about everything in the world. Okay. <laughs> How many here in the audience were fans of former Vice President Dick Cheney? And she brought Dick Cheney's name up. We looked for the fire alarm, so. All right, I think your toughest day had to be when the CIA was criticized the Aldrich James story. And according to what I read, you resigned right after that? No, no, it was uh, nearly uh, two years after, and I didn't design over Ames. We caught Ames. Uh, the CIA counterintelligence people <laughs> had done a very good job, but they could do a, back in about uh, 90, 90, 91, but they could have done a better one if they'd had the FBI involved with them. So one thing they did about a year before I took over the CIA is the, is the CIA people who were working on trying to catch Ames and the FBI people got put together in a, essentially a counterintelligence center um, and uh, that led really to Ames's uh, capture uh, in I think uh, the January of uh, 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 nine of uh, well, a, a year, about a year before I left office. Uh, and uh, it was uh, um, a bad day from the point of view of people recognizing how much he'd stolen. It was a, a good de day from the point of view of FBI and CIA counterintelligence working together and having caught this guy. It's not easy to catch a spy, especially a smart one. So um, um, I uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, th there was certain feuding going on between the FBI and the CIA over who had how much responsibility for what in the aftermath of Ames and the FBI then uh, realized there was a second spy, a second mole, a, a second Russian inside the system, a Russian supporter inside the system. And we uh, stayed on that case for months and the, F the FBI was sure that this second spy was like Ames, a CIA person. And it turned out it was not. It was Hansen, an FBI person. So both sides in this back and forth thing uh, had <coughs> days where they thought things went well and ones where they were, were disappointed or lost a bureaucratic struggle or whatever. 
During the run-up to the election, you spoke very favorably about Donald Trump, the candidate. He gets elected. Washington Post reports on January 5th that even you, a veteran of four presidential administrations, one of the nation's leading intelligence agencies, resigned from the transition team, according to the Post now, because of growing tensions over President-elect Trump's vision for intelligence agencies. Is uh, that true? Not really. Uh, I, uh, I didn't actually resign, and I was never uh, uh, an endorser or surrogate. I was an advisor, and I agreed. Frankly, I agreed because I had some question about both Trump and Hillary Clinton, and I looked at it very carefully about a year before the election, or no, about four months before the election, and decided that I just could never go with Hillary, uh, particularly because the pay to play. The, the pay to play was just bribery. I mean, there's no other word for it. And uh, um, I was strongly opposed to that, so I agreed to advise Trump. I did so during the, the campaign for about four months, and then after the campaign was over, they continued to put me up on the Chiron uh, when I was on television and so forth as an advisor now to the transition. And since nobody would asked me to be an advisor of the transition, I wasn't. I didn't want to fly under false colors. So I put out a little statement saying I'm not an advisor to the transition, but that didn't change anything. That was the reality of the current situation. A lot of folks stirred around then for some reason. I have no idea why. And wrote newspaper articles and so forth. But uh, um, no, I, uh, I basically was just an advisor on the campaign and haven't been an advisor on anything since. But is it true you were offered your old job back to be the director of the CIA in the uh, Trump administration? The, uh, Mike Flynn uh, asked at one point just after the election if I would consider uh, my going back to my old job. And I realized after talking to him for a second that he would uh, want me to report to him rather than the president. <laughs> and so I turned it down. Six days after the victory? About. Wow. Did you have a problem with Michael Flynn? Yes. What was your problem? <laughs> He's giving me the Jack Webb answers here. Uh, this is all the subject of investigations and depositions and Lord knows what, and I'm going to let it stay there for the time being. This will all be clear of the fullness of time. Well, Business Insider reports that you had a problem with Flynn's handling of Turkey uh, to remove a leader from Turkey. Is that it? This uh, will all be clear in the fullness of time. <laughs> I did my homework, folks. All right, let's take the country side by side, Mr. Ambassador. First, North Korea. You have express concerns about EMPs. Yes. Do they have an EMP that could take out our electrical grid, as Frank Gaffney said two years ago in this very seat? I think uh, they have the components. In order to create an electromagnetic pulse, all you really need to do, and we learned this in 62 in the atmospheric tests just before the end of atmospheric tests under the treaties with Russia, uh, we had, uh, they had the ability to detonate a small nuclear charge at a relatively low altitude, 50, 60, 80, 100, 200 miles. Uh, that's low for a satellite. Um, and uh, if they can detonate a nuclear weapon at that level, and you could do it detonating it from a Scud missile that you fired up into that range too. It doesn't have to be a satellite, but the satellite's the easiest thing to do. That's why we and the Russians, the first things either of us did in space was orbit a small satellite, Sputnik for the Russians and another one for us about three months later. So if they had a satellite or, and we knew they had a m missile that could get a nuclear charge up to 50, 100, 200 miles and detonate it, we know from the events of 62, as I said, that they could take out essentially the electric grid. And if you wonder what life without the electric grid would be like, uh, look at Puerto Rico today. Uh, and they have hope that they can get something restored and going and partially going, whereas if the entire grid gets taken out by electronic uh, charge, um, 
you may well not be able to get things started up again for a very long time. Uh, so um, I think it's clear they have the components. Um, I, uh, uh, we know the Russians do. We know the Chinese do. Um, any country that has a, a, a capacity to launch a satellite either into orbit or just up a few hundred, couple hundred miles and has a nuclear weapon that will detonate when pickled off and most of them would if they're properly designed, um, uh, then under those circumstances, yes, you have to worry about that country, including North Korea, having an electro, the capacity to uh, create an electromagnetic pulse. By the way, the Earth has been bombarding the sun with electromagnetic uh, uh, magnetized radio waves now for about 4.1 billion years. So this isn't, isn't new, it's just that the first time Americans focused on this, except for a very few specialists in the military, was back in 62 when this, uh, uh, these tests were undertaken just before the test ban treaty lapsed. So does the CIA, and I don't know what you can answer, does the CIA have operatives that infiltrate North Korea to know what they're thinking? <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let me try it this way. See, I, and I talked to him earlier and I said, you know, this is going to be stuff you can't answer. So you just don't answer it. CIA, the uh, Wall Street Journal said the CIA is hiring more people. That mm. would mean to say to me that there's going to be more work for them to do and there's more places to be. Is that a logical conclusion or are a bunch of people retiring? Well, lots of things are happening. Uh, they do need, I think, to bring some more people on, particularly people with language uh, skills and languages that would be uh, at issue uh, needed uh, uh, to conduct these sorts of uh, uh, operations. Uh, often that uh, might be uh, uh, Russian, it uh, might be Spanish, given all the uh, openings and issues that have come up with Latin America and Venezuela and elsewhere. Um, it uh, might well be Arabic. Um, uh, it uh, might well be Farsi. So some of those languages are useful and we don't have enough people in, in we probably have enough in Spanish, but not enough in, in some of those others. Uh, I, I think it's uh, also important to realize that whereas intelligence is largely a matter of stealing secrets and analyzing what you've stolen, uh, that's uh, not probably going to be <clears throat> front and center uh, in the years to come because uh, though that theft can occur via computers and we have plenty of people stealing our uh, cyber material and sometimes I would imagine we steal theirs um, and that whole world is a world of its own but you need a number of people doing it, but you need people who know this world a lot, not just speak a language. So we're going to have to increase, I think, our, our ability to hold on to and incentivize for a career uh, technical people with uh, uh, cyber backgrounds and so forth. Um, it's, uh, uh, I think, a uh, uh, misconception uh, that the Russians are just running a normal intelligence collection business. I'll get into the Russians in a minute, but they have, according to Ian Mihai Pachepa, P-A-C-E-P-A, -E who was the head of Romanian intelligence when he defected in 1979 and knew all of the intelligence heads in Eastern Europe, as well as in Dropoff and, and Gorbachev and everybody senior in the Soviet Union. Pachepa says that the Russians have more people at any one point in time running what they call their disinformation operations. For disinformation, read lies. They have more people running their disinformation operations than they do in their armed forces. 
And uh, if you want to read an absolutely fascinating book on all of this, read Pachepa's book, uh, Disinformatia, Disinformation. Um, and he's written two others, but pretty much everything that he's working has worked on is, is in that last one that's been out a few, few, few years. I think that, that um, we're going to need people to thwart the Soviet, or still Soviet, uh, bad gem, the, the Russian uh, approaches both toward disinformation and toward cyber attacks. These are new worlds for us. And uh, um, we've done a little bit of disinformation ourselves uh, over time, but mainly uh, we've tried to, with Radio Free Europe and the like, we've tried to tell the truth uh, rather than create lies uh, the way the Russians have. So uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot more need for new people, and it's, uh, uh, but it's going to be in some of these areas, not just regular spying. How clandestine is the relationship between North Korea and Iran? We hear that they work together. They work together a great deal. Um, I uh, get my information on this from newsletters and things on the web, and that's the, the, what I would suggest people who are interested in it, because the basic information is classified, but stuff leaks out and people give briefings and so forth. So I just go to the web and see what it says about, about uh, uh, the relationship uh, between uh, uh, Iran and, uh, and North uh, Korea. Uh, but uh, Iran, uh, I hope, knock on wood, doesn't have a nuclear weapon yet, although I think they will before long. I think this uh, agreement, the JCPOA, is the worst international agreement the United States has ever signed. And. It not only makes it clear that in about eight or nine years they'll have a nuclear weapon, it, uh, by its loose terms, makes it uh, uh, highly likely they'll have it sooner. If you and I were UN inspectors of the, under the current JCPOA, and we heard from some place that 100 miles north of Tehran, uh, there is an area that uh, uh, seemed to be from various sensors to be emitting radioactivity. We don't know what happened up there. Something might have happened. Shall we go look at it? Sure. So we agree. We notify the Iranian government. We want to go look at this area 100 miles north of Tehran. And they say, whoops, I'm sorry. That's a military base. And you don't get to look at military bases. And we said, what do you mean it's a military base? It, it wasn't a military base this morning. And they said, well, it has been since this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, the Iranians also have not turned loose to all countries and all parts of all countries the uh, material that is in addenda to the JCPOA. Uh, and uh, uh, they hid it for a long time from the United States. We may now have it, but other countries don't that are part of the agreement. If they haven't fully disseminated those appendices of the agreement, then under its terms, the agreement has not started to run. And so we are under no obligation to back off of the limitations and restrictions on sales of goods and so forth that we have now uh, uh, with Iran. So uh, I don't think it's in effect. I think if it is in effect, it's worse than worthless. And I think if uh, it uh, uh, runs its full course, they're going to have nuclear weapons as well as satellites, which they have now. Uh, and uh, I think it would be the best thing in the world for the United States not to have this uh, agreement around anymore. By the way, there's an easy way to get rid of it. When this was put to the Congress, it was put in as an executive agreement without the, a statute was added later, but an executive agreement like minor matters are uh, done that this way in, a lot in international affairs. But something as important and vital as this, under any history and assumptions of the Constitution and what constitutes a treaty, this should have been submitted as a treaty, not 
as as an executive agreement with no d documentation or anything coming from Congress. If it had been properly s submitted to the Congress to deal with as a treaty, only the Senate would have dealt with it, and under the U.S. Constitution, they would have been needed two-thirds of the Senate in order for it to become the law of the land. They did not do that. They fiddled around with the cloture rule in some way that's kind of mysterious, but they did, some of the Democrats and some of the Republicans worked with the Obama administration and got this done. But it's essentially fraudulent to call this thing uh, an executive agreement. It's a, it's a treaty that's been submitted, and if it were now submitted as a treaty, I have no confidence, no doubt, I have no doubt that it would fail to get the two-thirds that it needs in a constitutionally real world uh, to become effective. We're going to be taking questions from the audience in the next few minutes. Think of your questions. We're going to call you down very quickly. I didn't mention this up front, but I did tell my radio audience because they were interested. From, in your opinion, what the heck is going on in Niger? Four Americans die. Do we have a national security interest in Niger? Yes, because Northern Africa and, and West Africa are going increasingly under the, uh, uh, the flow, influenced by the flow of refugees out of Africa and into Europe influenced by the uh, whole uh, uh, thrust of decision making that needs to be made about how to deal with the chaos that is either present or coming steadily in countries like Libya. Uh, all of that uh, uh, really uh, needs to be uh, uh, dealt with and if you don't uh, you will see, I think, Northern Africa going uh, uh, the way of uh, 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 what the worst parts of the Mideast have, have gone. And you will see uh, Islamist uh, 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 domination of important parts of Africa, including probably po quite possibly the oil carrying parts. Um, and um, uh, we need to decide how to deal with it and not be on again, off again Finnegan the, the way uh, we were with Iraq. Uh, but uh, if we decide to deal with it, and I think we should, and work with native forces like the, uh, 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 from, from Niger and elsewhere, um, and work together with the French who have been in much of this part of the world for decades, centuries. Uh, um, I think that if we will, will move that way, uh, we can perhaps uh, prevent the, the, uh, the chaos that uh, otherwise will, uh, will come to Northern Africa. But I'm afraid if we sit on our hands again, and I said before we came in here that one of the truest things that's ever been said about the United States was Winston Churchill's line that the Americans always do the right thing, but unfortunately only after they've exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> you were quoted in the Washington Examiner on criticism of President Trump. You said, Trump hasn't said anything as bad as Bush claiming he saw Putin's soul. Right? I think that's right. Can you elaborate on that? I said Trump hadn't said anything as bad as Bush said. Yeah. Well, I has, <laughs> has Mr. Putin authorized the KGB to give him a soul? Yeah. I don't know. When you first heard that comment from President Bush, did you put your head in your hands? What Pretty you much. Say? Yeah. I kind of, I kind of rolled my eyes. I just couldn't believe it. I, I, I like George W. Bush. I think in many ways he was a, a, a good president, not, not a great one, but a good one. Uh, but uh, th I thought this was a really far out remark. 
Well, don't forget, this is the same club that brought us Barack Obama, who's sitting in a setting like this, reaches over and says, you know, when I'm reelected, it'll be a lot easier. Do you, uh, do you want to hear, before we break up something, what, it's about what's coming down the road on the Kennedy assassination? Yeah, the president said he's going to, yeah, because the president said he's going to release the documents, but then I hear today, no surprise. Well, it depends on what you look at. And again, I would start with Pacepa's book and the section on the Kennedy assassination. Because, uh, and my uh, uh, late uh, father-in-law in, in uh, 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 did, did uh, a lot of the work for the Secret Service on the technical uh, aspects uh, of this and uh, 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 was one of the bright lights uh, in uh, uh, moving the Warren Commission along to actually getting something done. But um, it was a, uh, uh, his name was Miller, but it, it, the other part of the parcel of the problem that needs to get looked at is whether the heads of all, as Pachepa says, of all of the in, uh, 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 internal, the intelli intelligence services, not internal, the te intelligence services of all of the Warsaw Pact countries were right back in the 80s when they talked with one another and agreed that this is what had happened in the Kennedy assassination attempt, because unfortunately Kennedy assassination. Um, they all said, according to Pachepa, that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Khrushchev felt he had looked really clumsy and had been outmaneuvered by Kennedy and he lost the public relations issue, and he was, it's a very rugged, angry, you know, shoe pounding in the UN guy. He got absolutely furious, according, again, to the intelligence heads of the other the countries. He got really furious and ordered Kennedy to be assassinated. This is in early 63. And the KGB began the preparations. Oswald was recruited. Oswald's a sniper, was. Uh, uh, he was a strong Marxist-Leninist ideologue. He went to every uh, 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 length he possibly could to be very well trained and know exactly where he was going to have his weapon in the te Texas Book Depository, all of that. Went to Mexico, was, was provided with a Russian communist wife by the KGB. All of the things that you've read about, about him taking these actions, acting alone was the way it was all thought about before. But it, now, it looks clear to me at least, that Khrushchev ordered the process to start and then, according to Pachepa, got cold feet. And about a month and a half or so before the assassination was to occur, Khrushchev called it off. Now he has an obedient KGB with everybody having gotten ready to assassinate President Kennedy, but having now on second thought, Khrushchev deciding, well, you know, this would probably cause a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, and that may not be a great idea. So even Khrushchev cooled off and put out orders, everybody should stop, back to square one, we're not going to do it. Everybody stopped except one guy. It was Oswald. After he assassinated President Kennedy along the lines, just one, according to Pachepa, just one, uh, one man did it. And then he unexpectedly was caught by the Dallas police and then later that day or early the next, mo being moved from one jail uh, uh, to another, he gets killed by Jack Ruby. Ruby, according to Pachepa, did that because Ruby was a Cuban agent and the Russians had told the Cubans they'd got to get somebody to kill Ruby, to kill Oswald. 
And uh, Ruby was the Cuban agent who killed Oswald, so Oswald would never be able to talk about this. That's what's in Pachepa's book. Do I know that it's true? No, I don't. Do I think it sounds more plausible than particularly the far out theories that come in about the assassination? Yes. Do I think it sounds more plausible than it was all Oswald acting alone and he never had any help from anybody? I, I don't see how he could have done it if he hadn't had the help from KGB early on. So I do think Pachepa, and there are some things that are in these releases that will, will make this, I think, more, more understandable. But there are some things that, that uh, will lead people, I believe, to an examination along the lines of what Pachepa uh, has said. And former CBS newsman Bob Schieffer, who was in Dallas that day, will be here November 20th to talk about it. Do you Re think that he was a, a solo shooter? Was there one shooter or was there another shooter? From what Pachepa has come up with, it looks like he was a solo shooter. I don't think, uh, uh, we may never know absolutely for sure, and you have all this long dispute about uh, where the round went and and the, do you believe the magic bullet so theory? I, 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 for the time being, do not believe any one outcome of this analysis. But of the ones I have heard, I think Pachepa's is the most plausible. Let's take questions from the audience. Looking for students, come down very quickly and ask you a question. While we're looking for students to be brave enough, Jerry, you have a question? Come down, we have two microphones set up. We have a limited amount of time to do this. So if you'll line up, ask your question of the ambassador, he'll answer it, we'll move on. You're first tonight, Jerry, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Russian collusion recently, uh, but if we look back into like the 70s and the 80s, there's a lot of documentation that there was collusion uh, with the KGB and also with radical uh, Islamic terrorists. And of course, uh, I, I believe Pachepa had mentioned about the Soviet Union would try to fake its death, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, after the fall of the, uh, of the uh, Berlin Wall, what happened to those networks between the KGB and radical Islamic terrorists? Are the Russians still working with radical Islamic terrorists? Yeah, the, the, the Russians are never not working with a <coughs> radical Islamic terrorists. Uh, from uh, uh, training, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat to uh, all of the things they've done over the years. They, uh, they push uh, uh, anti-Semitism and uh, link up with the radical Islamists on that. They, they push hostility to the existence of the state of Israel. That's what they mean when they say no Zionism. Uh, they are uh, deeply involved in um, doing whatever they can to undermine uh, uh, Israel and uh, to uh, function in a range of ways as anti-Semites. And they also uh, uh, are uh, heavily uh, anti-Catholic and hostile to the Pope. And one thing that is interesting in Pachepa's book is the history of the, the Photoshopping and, and other changes that they've made and things in order to do documents and so forth to make it look like the Pope was, was doing bad things when in fact he was trying to uh, help the people who were uh, uh, trying to assassinate Hitler back in the 30s. It, it's an interesting set of, set of stories, but they go after both, particularly the Jews and the Catholics. Um, and uh, they do it with a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, and why? Well, they want to undermine the West's confidence in its values and its basic propositions of existence. They think the key thing is to make everybody in the West, intellectuals, college students, everybody, lose heart and lose a sense of allegiance to the basics. So they, they don't just do sophisticated stuff, they go after religious beliefs and, and uh, very much in, in spades. To the left now, your question for the ambassador. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is uh, Alex Pantaleo, and um, my question is, um, 
A hot topic issue today is immigration. Do you, uh, immigration? Yeah. Do you think that immigration uh, goes hand in hand with national security, and if that's um, a national security issue, if you will? Uh, two kinds of immigration. Legal immigration, uh, I'm all for. Uh, this country uh, is a nation of immigrants. Uh, the, what's on the base of the Statue of Liberty is, is a great poem by Emma Lazarus. And uh, our technical and scientific collective ability is heavily derived from other countries sending very smart and able people here. Uh, we had uh, in uh, 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 about three years ago, there were four Nobel Prize winners, I think, in physics. I may not have these numbers exactly right, but, but it, I think there were four. And three of them, I think they were all immigrants from Britain and three of them, one is Americans and one, one is a Brit, I think. I, I, but wh who were these folks? These were people who had done superbly at universities in Britain and w but were caught by the lure of the freedom and openness and opportunities and creativity in the United States. And uh, we, we want those folks. Now, do we want illegal immigrants? No. Uh, do we want to treat fairly the children of illegal immigrants? I think yes, we want to treat them fairly and give them a chance at getting through the system. Um, but um, however much we need to take steps to police things so that only people who have gone through the proper procedures actually get to come, I think uh, uh, we really ought to be particularly friendly to immigrants. They're the, the reason we are demographically a country that is growing, whereas virtually all of Europe and a lot of other countries, their demography is declining and they're going away, and we're not. Over here, your question now. Your tenure as the director of the CIA happened directly after the fall of the Soviet Union. Did you find that it consolidated the number of threats that we face as a country, or did it cause a deconsolidation that made it harder for the agency to protect our interests at home and abroad? And how has the consequences rippled into modern time? Well, the impact on me in managing the CIA for those, that period of time was that the fact that the Soviet Union had collapsed meant that some very able and patriotic and strong folks that continued to astound me took the view, Jim, you know, the, the Cold War is over. We don't really need a CIA anymore, do we? <laughs> well, I got that from a lot of people. And, and uh, I spent a good deal of my time when I was director, fighting off various members of my congressional committee who were trying to take all our money and move it to something else. Um, and it, it was uh, really extremely uh, uh, frustrating. Uh, and uh, it was the same attitude that the parents and grandparents of a lot of people here uh, had back in the 1930s. Uh, it was, hey, Party time, we got an ocean on this side, we got an ocean on that side, we've won this last war, World War II, time to play. Yeah, no, we don't need a draft. Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, in September of 1941, two years into World War II, Sam Rayburn saved the draft by one vote in the House of Representatives. One vote. That's how, hey, cool man, we were in 1941, ignoring a very mature and bloody war in Europe, which the Brits in the air won by the skin of their teeth, and saying, hey, yeah, party time. We gotta watch out for that. We do that a lot. Over here, your question to the ambassador. Good evening. A lot of students here are seeking to obtain internships in federal agencies, and I was wondering if you had any insights in order to secure an internship. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know any uh, alternative approach than just to go, go to the web and, and follow the system. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, you can probably also do, get a 
chance it's somebody requesting you specifically if you know them, but, but uh, I don't even know if that works now. I think it generally- So if it goes to their congressman, it doesn't really help. Well, probably not. Is it possible that the congressman would say, you know, my brother runs such and such, and if you will work for him for a year, uh, see how you do, then maybe I can move you into working for me next year or something. I don't know. But I, I, I wouldn't count on there being an alternative path uh, that has any reliability to it. George. Ambassador, uh, since 9-11, could you describe the role that the agency has uh, in fighting our new threats versus before 9-11 and the growth of national security spending? Thank Great you. question, because I always wondered if Homeland Security kind of undercut the CIA at all. Well, no, not, not really. I mean, they, the CIA basically operates overseas, and it coordinates with foreign intelligence services. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't really get tangled up with Department of Homeland Security particularly. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the heart uh, uh, of the matter is that the, the CIA um, and NSA with their code breaking together have done a really good job since 9-11. And they've stopped a lot of things that, that we don't know about, and the reason we don't know about it is exactly right, because if the world knows about it, then the terrorists know about it, and if the terrorists know about it, they're gonna get some feeling for how we have done stuff. Bob uh, Gates reportedly, I haven't asked Bob about this, so I'm not sure this is right, but it was in the press. Um, in the hours after we successfully uh, killed bin Laden, uh, there were several leaks from the White House, uh, uh, and it was from one of a very small handful of people uh, because they were the only ones who knew what happened. And supposedly Bob passed by an office where several of these folks were sitting and said, hey, I've, uh, got a, a strategic communications plan for you. And they said, oh, really what? He said, shut the bleep up. <laughs> <laughs> Good rules for Snowden and everybody else who wants to turn stuff loose. You are killing people when you do that. You are killing Americans who are trying to figure out how best to help our country by spying on the likes of uh, Russia and Iran and North Korea and so on. And they, they do die and they are killed. And uh, secrets are lost that can be used to, to protect Americans in the future. So uh, uh, I, uh, I think if you take, have one takeaway from this session, I'd take that one away. By the way, is Snowden, in your mind, a traitor to the United States? Uh, he has, to, in order to be called a traitor, he has to be uh, tried uh, successfully before a jury of his peers and uh, sentenced uh, by uh, the court. Uh, if that occurs, I'll uh, call him uh, a traitor. Uh, since it hasn't happened yet, I would say I would like to see the various parts of the United States government that would be involved in this get busy and do everything they can to prosecute him. And you are a lawyer, so he can say it, as you are a lawyer. In the audience, your question now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, after the 9-11 Commission, uh, there was a big push to get interagency inter cooperation and communication going. Uh, it seems like domestic intelligence is still kind of left out of the loop on that. What needs to happen to get these agencies to cooperate and communicate with each other? Uh, a lot of it uh, is bureaucratic, but it's also exaggeration of some steps that are important, uh, such as uh, protecting civil liberties. Uh, we are certainly tougher in wartime on this sort of thing than we are in peacetime. And it, the problem with 
civil liberties and safety and security is that they both really are important and they really do conflict. So back before 9-11, there was a document, a memorandum that had been drafted, I believe, by the Department of Justice that effectively set up stovepipes, not one but several, and not only barred the FBI from getting some material from the CIA and the CIA from getting some material from the FBI, but also barred different parts of the FBI from talking to one another. And uh, by the judgment of people who've studied this far more carefully than, than I have, uh, it seems as if those memoranda were one of the factors that made it really hard to uh, have gotten uh, inside the Al Qaeda operation uh, or the Bin Laden operation uh, beforehand. And there was uh, one, I forget his name, but one of the conspirators who was very much on the screen of uh, some people in Washington, but uh, they didn't have the right authority to, uh, to uh, stop what he had, uh, he had done. So we went, before 9-11, I think we had gone overboard on the don't worry about security, the only thing that matters is liberty side. Uh, we've adjusted a bit, and we're always gonna be adjusting that very important balance. Uh, but I, uh, I think that we, one way to figure out what not to do is go back and look at the documentation and the steps that were made and the, and the judgments that were made before 9-11 and don't do that again. Over here, your question. Good evening, Ambassador. I'm not sure if you're familiar with a book titled The Foundations of Geopolitics by Alexander Dugan. By Ale who? Alexander Dugan. It calls for a kind of divide and conquer strategy against the West by the Russians. Given recent tensions between opposing factions in America and what you said earlier about disinformation, do you believe we're prepared to be able to face, face the Russians with this issue? Uh, the way to deal with the Russians on this, I think, is not to face them, but to trick them. Uh, give you an example. Um, Bill Casey, my predecessor several CIA directors up, uh, who was with Reagan, uh, um, was a very shrewd customer. And early in the Reagan administration, uh, uh, one of uh, Casey's uh, uh, favorite CIA officers, uh, kind of an isolated fellow who thought up new technical stuff, uh, came to Casey and, with an idea. Casey liked it, took it to Reagan. This has been published and approved by the CIA now, for, it's in a book. Uh, took it to uh, Reagan. Casey explained it to Reagan. Reagan said it sounded like a terrific idea. So um, what happened was the Russians, among other things, were stealing, uh, uh, this is early 80s, so it wasn't very, in today's terms, advanced electronics, but it was advanced electronics for then. They were stealing not only the design, but also some hardware and so forth from facilities that they had access to in the United States. And um, Casey and his CIA sidekick uh, went to, to one of our major manufacturing companies, I'm not sure which one, and together three or four people uh, redesigned very slightly the electronics that the Russians were stealing. We didn't say a word to the Russians. We didn't pound the table. We didn't complain. We didn't go to Congress and have hearings. They just made a small adjustment and kind of looked the other way as the Russians continued to steal the electronics. Well, a few years later, Casey and Reagan uh, reportedly uh, were uh, uh, looking at some of the recent uh, film uh, from uh, uh, satellite cameras, and they could sit in the Oval Office and watch one by one 
Russian power plants and uh, 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 natural gas facilities and oil facilities go boom, boom, boom. It, 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 Sun Tzu had this all right. Uh, uh, it, 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 this is, war is a matter of trickery. You will never win unless you outfox the other side. And outfoxing them does not mean standing up and complaining to them when they do something. It means figuring out how to use their behavior to their detriment. And if we don't have enough people doing that now, and I don't think we do, that's the skill that I, frankly, if I were still in this job, I would mainly look for in people who wanted to work for the CIA. Over here, your question, precious minutes left. Uh, good evening. evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, earlier this year, a uh, travel ban um, on uh, hostile countries. I'm was, sorry, which? Uh, no, travel, travel ban, ban yeah. was ordered on host like uh, more yeah. dangerous countries. Closer and, to the mic, if you can. And um, there were some debates that sparked from that, whether it was lawful or efficient. We already seen the Supreme Court, um, they agreed with it, they said it's okay to do. Um, but uh, I was just wondering how you, what you think about the efficiency of the ban was? Well, I think the president made a mistake by making his first uh, announcement uh, be one that was tied to religions. I mean, we're, this country has First Amendment and we're not going to discriminate against somebody based, I think, should not, based on his religion. Now, if it's a religion in which he rejects the Constitution, uh, or something, then you've got a little more complicated situation. But generally speaking, um, I don't think we ought to say that if, if someone ha worships in such and such a, uh, a church or synagogue or mosque that uh, he ought not to uh, be admitted to the United States. The second time around, the, the White House started looking at countries and there, I think the president has every constitutional right to bar a Im immigration from, let's say, New Zealand went crazy. And we just had to stop people coming in from New Zealand. Pretty unlikely, but uh, uh, could he do that constitutionally? Yes, I think so. Now, there was another case in a lower court, I think about the same time, that had a, uh, 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 was some kind of a ruling that essentially said that since the president had said he, uh, off the record or just into the public, that he wanted to do this for reasons uh, of religion, the fact that he had now shifted gears and going to court didn't matter and he ought to still lose. So there's, there's a lot of backing and legal backing and forthing going on about this. But as a general proposition, I don't think he would have had anywhere near the kind of trouble that this has produced if he had said, uh, named three or four countries which have a lot of terrorists from them and say, I'm not gonna let people come in from this country for the next six months or a year and we'll take stock again after that time's up. We're going to just take the, the final people we have over here. Your question quickly for Ambassador Wilson. Good evening, sir. Uh, one of my questions. You can, the gentleman is just going up. No, stay. You guys stay. You stay. I'm just saying that we're not <laughs> going to take others. Go ahead. All right. My question is, so the U.S. is facing a lot of enemies in this world right now, mostly or largely Sunni extremist groups. So ISIS and Al-Qaeda are two of the major ones, and we've got a lot of others, but they're being trained by within borders of countries that we're allied with, like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia. Yet it seems like so many of our efforts are against like Iran, which they're fighting those uh, groups as well. But I was wondering how exactly are we supposed to deal with these sorts of groups that are being trained basically by people that are affiliated with our allies within countries that we're allied with? Yeah, good, good question. They, uh, this is a, a real a, a tough one. Uh, in order to try to uh, keep track of all this and, and who is actually what, who, what, because you have some KGB people who are training terrorists uh, uh, all the time. Uh, I, I think the most important thing from an intelligence perspective is to try to figure out how to infiltrate these groups. Uh, it, uh, you don't need a lot of people inside them, but you really need some. 
uh, because it's going to be very, very hard to sort out who is actually doing what, who is actually the leader, who is uh, uh, doing uh, who you want to focus on. And you have the, the Sunni Shia rivalry. Uh, right now, the Sunnis and the persons of the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Saudis. Um, and interestingly enough, they're not Sunni, but the Israelis uh, uh, are uh, uh, working together. Uh, uh, and that is an interesting uh, development if together with the destruction of the caliphate uh, uh, for ISIS, we may be in a situation where um, things improve for us in the Mideast, but they still crop up over here uh, in the form of uh, uh, terrorist acts in the United States. But uh, this is a tough one. Sorry not to be more complete. Over here, your question. They say from history, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, we tend to find through history that um, countries and groups politically, because everything is actually politics, the way the policies are made, the things that you do in your life, all those decisions that you do make up who you are and the ide ideologies that you follow. Um, what we seem to find these days, uh, personally, I find that the Democratic Party tends to find a scapegoat in Russia with a lot of current events and stuff. Um, we found that when we warred against communism back in the last century, that we were fighting communism. Anymore with the Russian people, uh, there doesn't seem to be an, quite an enemy anymore. Instead, the group is just found as something to war against. Um, could you uh, help uh, clarify what it is uh, that Russia, well, let's see, produces as uh, a threat against the United States? There's never been a very good clarification on that. Okay, uh, let's right. see if we can get that. Well, uh, uh, I'm going to come back to Pachepa's book. Uh, I think all three of them are great, but the last one, which is called Disinformatia, uh, is about this. And uh, I think it's key uh, that one understand exactly the kinds of issues that you brought up. Uh, but uh, uh, another line about history that I've always uh, liked is Mark Twain's. Uh, he said, history doesn't uh, repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> And in some of the terrorist groups, we find they rhyme with other terrorist groups. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Shia right now, particularly under the thumb of the Iranians, are uh, uh, a very, and under the protection of the JCPOA for Iran's nuclear program, they are in a situation where they may look forward to absolute devastation being pretty easy for them to, to come about and to, to propagate. Um, and uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, very troubling. Uh, I would not put Russia absolutely first on my list. The most urgent one, I think, is North Korea because of the electromagnetic pulse. And right close behind it is Iran because uh, it, the the uh, Iranians are theocratic, totalitarian, genocidal imperialists. And that's not a string of expletives. Theocratic, you have no doubt that the Iranians are theocratic, right? The mullahs and all that. Totalitarian, uh, murdering hundreds to thousands of kids as they demonstrate peacefully in the streets, as this uh, Iranian regime uh, uh, does, is pretty totalitarian, theocratic, totalitarian. Genocidal, they began a large share of their meetings chanting death to America and death to Israel. And imperialists, uh, they're doing everything they can in Yemen and in Syria and elsewhere to spread their Iranian empire and they're gonna be working on it for a long time. So I'd say Russia and Iran, and that right today, they're cooperating, unfortunately, with one another, are two very major targets we gotta keep uh, in mind, because they are after us, and they want us to completely go away. They want us either, in Iran's case, converted or dead. In Russia's case, they want us dead. Over here, your question. 
Good evening, Ambassador. In regards to the events that transpired on September 11, 2012 in Benghazi, Libya, what are your thoughts on the former Secre Secretary, Secretary of State Clinton and fellow advisors on their role and responsibility for the event? I can't figure out what they thought they were doing. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I mean, I try not to. Was it the video? Huh? Was it the video? I don't think it was the video. Uh, I, I'm not bad at getting inside the heads of terrorists and dictators, and I've always somehow kind of enjoyed that, but I'm awful at getting inside the heads of American political figures. I can never figure out what Hillary's doing or why, and so I'm going to stop trying. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Benghazi was a mess. I don't know that the full story is out yet. I don't think it was the, mo the, the movie. Uh, uh, the video. Um, I don't have any, because it requires me to get inside the head of an American political figure, I, would, I will fail if I try to. I believe this is Dr. J.T. Shem. That is I correct. correct. You, thank you for coming tonight. He's an MBA, a consultant, and coach developing top leaders in Orlando. That might be a spy satellite right now. Your question now for Ambassador Attorney Mark Zaid says to tell you hello. Yeah. He says you're a big supporter of his uh, new whistleblower effort at yes. www.whistleblowerade.org. I am. He says, how can the government prevent classified leaks and better protect whistleblowers? And my question is, how do people like Snowden, if they see something they feel is morally wrong, how do they bring it to people's attention without violating their oath? Well, um, Mark has a nonprofit that he is creating to try to, with the aid of a former whistleblower, to try to help people who re see a real grievance inside their department or agency that somebody is doing something wrong or and, and something that really ought to be changed and they can't get their boss's attention for it or they can't get attention for it within the regular procedures. What he has come up with is a nonprofit that on the side, people would have their adequate security clearances and so forth, and uh, that would be agreed ahead of time that it is sort of a last resort, one could go to this, this sidebar uh, organization as a way to get, say, the, the Secretary of State or whoever is the boss of the, of the structure you're talking about to um, um, uh, have something come before them. Uh, it's not a bad idea. It's a responsible effort to, I think, to deal with uh, conflict uh, because uh, some people uh, call themselves whistleblowers and they don't really have anything to blow the whistle about. They just want the, the, what they consider to be the prestige of it and they don't mind leaking to the world. And if you leak to anybody, you leak to the world. Uh, so uh, Mark's trying to balance those, those two values and it it's not easy but i think he's uh he's uh, uh doing uh doing the best he can and he's uh, getting started with an interesting organization to uh to do that i am no friend of the uh leakers under other circumstances uh, uh the one thing i would say is that uh the pentagon papers leaker Remind me. Snowden? No, Pentagon Papers, oh. years oh. ago. Ellsberg. Berg, Daniel Ellsberg and I and uh, Snowden's lawyer and um, another party were debating in th this, these issues about leaking and, and so forth. And I did a little research on the different people, and I ho hold no brief whatsoever for Snowden. I would, uh, I think he damaged the United States a lot, and I would very much like to see a very vigorous prosecution of him. Ellsberg is more complicated. If you compare him to Snowden, he didn't turn loose directly or indirectly any technology um, he didn't get anybody killed. These were po the Pentagon Papers were policy papers. I'm sure they're very sensitive for their time, but what what happened was that Ellsberg was overseas, and they told him to come back, and he came back and submitted to the jurisdiction of the American courts, and pled not guilty, 
and was tried and the court made a procedural error which released him. Now his, his he was whistleblowing because he was post policy terms to the Vietnam War. And I don't say that he was right. I don't think any leaks of classified information are right because often they could turn something loose that you, you aren't realize you're turning loose, aren't realizing you're turning loose. But if you compare Ellsberg to Snowden, Snowden, I think, damaged the country's capabilities in some very major and serious ways, and he would not take responsibility for it. He won't come back and be tried. He, he is hiding out. And I think comparing Ellsberg and Snowden, I'm sorry Ellsberg leaked what he leaked that was classified, but, but he in essence is an honorable man who is willing to, to face the consequences of what he did. And, and that's the opposite of Snowden and several of these other people. Finally, your question. Thank you. Um, before you became the CIA director, what reservations did you have about the job and what really made you want to do it? Well, uh, <laughs> I didn't really uh, know that I was going to do it. I was uh, tapped at the last minute, I mentioned, I think, earlier, uh, uh, by, uh, b because I was recommended by Dave McCurdy, a friend who was at chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and as I said, as a fellow Oki, me, and we've known each other a long time, and he couldn't do it and, and proposed me, but um, they almost, did I say this in the group, they almost announced me as, uh, as an admiral yeah. because they had done so little uh, thorough yeah, Myers. preparation. Um, I uh, um, was honored very much. I'd done a lot with intelligence over the years. Uh, uh, I was undersecretary of the Navy for three years and headed up almost all the work on Navy intelligence. Uh, I uh, was general counsel of the Senate Armed Services Committee before there were intelligence committees. And so I was in charge of, as a staffer, of uh, handling the oversight of the intelligence community for, for the, the Senate. Um, I had run commissions that analyzed our reconnaissance uh, satellites and figured out what changes we ought to make in their deployment and, and emphasis. Um, and uh, so I had a fair amount of experience in the technical and strategic side of intelligence. I did not have any in espionage except reading the novels of David Ignatius and John le Carre and so forth. Um, so um, I think that uh, it, it descended upon me and I had to decide rather quickly uh, what to do. And uh, I uh, decided I could probably do an okay job because of my experience and uh, it would be interesting and it, it, it was. Uh, I would love to have been able to do it at a time where I was mainly fighting with or trying to understand and trick uh, Russians and Iranians and, and rather than uh, the House uh, Committee Chairman. <laughs> so we'd like to thank uh, Chivalry Wu on camera um, and thank you everybody up in control, uh, Tony Petro and your folks, to our students who worked with us in seating everybody today, to our security folks who worked, and mostly to you who took time from your evening your day to come and be with us in the Embry Real Speaker Series. Let's tell you about what we have coming up on November 1st. We're going to shift gears back to planetary exploration based on last year's very popular Mars experience. This time it's the Jupiter experience. The words and music of Jupiter are going to be portrayed right here, a discussion, and we'll have the pep band assembled right here, about a 75 minute format once again to look at all that is Jupiter. I think you'll love the images. And you'll love the discussion. That's November 1st, right here in the Lemeron Auditorium. We have three or four events after that. I think it's three, four more events, including uh, Bob Schieffer on November 20th. Thank you once again for being with us. Once again, a round of applause for our guest tonight, former CIA Director James Wilson.